This is part two of nuclear events and their aftermaths. Um, one of the things I, it was hard to find a title to fit everything in, but basically the idea was that nuclear events never really end. So we might look at a, a bomb blast, but the, as we all know, the, the effects will last for generations and generations, and that's why we're all here today. So we're thinking about that. Um, and all of the people here on the screen are going to be sharing their experiences and knowledge about one of these events. So the Tokyo Electric Power Company's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster, uh, which happened in, which started in March, 2011. And so this is actually the point where I entered the nuclear space was um, with the onset of this nuclear disaster. And basically I was studying agroecology. I was really interested in organic farming and sustainable food systems. And then the nuclear disaster happened. And I had this huge cognitive dissonance about how could we have sustainable food and farming when there are these uranium derived radionuclides all around. And then on top of that, we were not really supposed to talk about them. And so that's where I, I did my master's research on the topic. I felt like I just brushed the surface. And so I really wanted to study further. So I decided to do a PhD because I had so many more questions. And I was lucky enough to do a PhD here in Aotearoa where it's possible to have open discussions about nuclear issues. Again, thanks to the years and years of work by mostly Maori and Pacific activists who set the foundation uh, for this ability um, to have a conference like this, to be able to have these discussions. Um, so I met all the people on the screen. Chiba-san, <laughs> I have not really met Chiba-san yet, but I met Chiba-san through uh, Tomoki or Tommy, um, who I saw speak about TEPCO's nuclear disaster in a way that really aligned with the way that I was thinking about things. So I connected with Tommy when this uh, connection or when this conference came about. Um, Miku was one of the first people we met through the Matsunaga Institute through Kalika's connection. So this connection building process was there. I had met Elena um, at a conference at Kyoto University a while back. We were on a panel together uh, with the amazing Aya Kimura. Elena's research, I've always remembered it. So I was very excited to compile this panel um, to talk about TEPCO's nuclear disaster. And the great thing about all of these speakers is I don't have to present to you. They can all tell you their experiences, um, many from on the ground in Japan. And so initially this was set up as a dialogue. So Tommy, Tomoki and Chiba-san would be in dialogue, Chiba-san being on the ground in Fukushima. Um, and then I, I will read their bios, but Miku um, has a, she has grown up in the um, fishing village in Miyagi. Elena was doing research in this area. And so they have been in dialogue with each other too. And so we have a lot of connection building happening in building these um, sessions as well. So with that, um, I have heard the news that uh, Chiba-san and Tommy will go first. Um, so let me read their bios. So Yumi Chiba resides in Iwaki City, Fukushima Prefecture. After the nuclear accident of 2011, she established the Network to Protect Children from Irradiation, also known as the Mother's Group, to pursue the issue of in initial ra radiation exposure, exposure in Iwaki. Chiba-san's organizing efforts focus mostly on measuring the radiation levels in air and soil in children's environments. She is also involved in issues demanding or issuing demands, petitions, sharing information, and organizing events about the contaminated water issue. So Chiba-san will be on the panel, which will follow this. And this session is kind of setting a foundation for what we will be discussing in the panel following. So Tommy, or sorry, Tomoki <laughs> Fukui, we also um, refer to um, as Tommy, is a Japanese American anthropology student from the occupied lands of Atfalati Kalapuya people. They are a PhD candidate at Columbia University, researching how Japanese nuclear reconstruction uses patriarchy and ableism to further Japanese capitalism and how it submerges imperialist histories of exposed labor and disability in Japan. 
And so I think we'll go ahead and play the pre-recorded video. Um, and Chiba-san will then be, so the video will have subtitles, and so you'll hear Chiba-san's words, and you can read them in English, and then um, they will be available for more dialogue on this. Thank you so much for sharing that amazing conversation. And I'm going to, we'll save questions for the end. Um, so I'm going to move on to Miku and Elena. Um, so yeah, like I said, for people who just joined the rooms, these are conversations between people, community members on the ground and people researching these issues. Um, so we get some really rich conversations like those. So Miku and Elena met through this conference process. We kind of put them together and asked them to form a presentation together. Um, so Miku Narisawa is originally from Miyagi, Japan. Um, she's currently a graduate student majoring in peace and environment studies at Meiji University in Tokyo. She also serves as an educational facilitator at Lokahi Foundation in Hawaii, where she coordinates global youth programs. Experiencing the Great East Japan earthquake at the age of 12 made her explore different aspects of peace building in the natural disaster and ocean conservation. After graduating from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Miku is now involved in local development projects, both with governments and communities to promote aquaculture in her hometown, where they are facing challenges of preserving culture, natural landscape, and people from climate change. And in the next panel session, um, Miku has um, invited Futoshi Aizawa, who's actually a, a fisherman, um, and so they'll be in conversation. So again, this panel is kind of setting a foundation for our panel discussion next. And Elena Inakyanai is a, currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Economics at Kyoto University. Her more recent research interests lie in illuminating inequitable power dynamics in fisheries governance structures amidst privatization processes. Elena's previous work as an assistant project coordinator at Portland State University involved organizing field trips for disaster management practitioners in Oregon to learn directly from the experiences of local people in Tohoku after the 311 triple disaster. So that's the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. Motivated by her experiences, Elena discovered her passion for ensuring the voices of local people are prioritized, respected, and celebrated in decision-making processes. Upon graduation, Elena plans to pursue a career in academia, aiming at encouraging a more inclusive and caring society. In her non-academic time, Elena loves spending time with her partner and her dog, Lulu, exploring local coffee shops and enjoying a craft beer in the beautiful autumn weather. Great, so I will pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Carly, for the introduction. I'm going to share a screen um, for a second. <laughs> Can you hear us okay on that side? We're sharing a microphone. Is it okay? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, so my name is Miku Narisawa, and we are joining from my hometown, Higashi Matsushima City, Miyagi, Japan, which is the northern part of Japan uh, called Tohoku region. So in the picture, you can see my hometown, a beautiful hometown um, here in Miyagi. From Tokyo is about two hours and also two hours drive from Fukushima Prefecture. Um, today I'm here with Elena, um, who are going to share her um, research on the governance and the power dynamics uh, of local fishery here in Miyagi and help prepare us for a panel discussion later with Hutoshi-san, a local um, seaweed fisher will, who will give uh, um, his opinion about um, the nuclear situation as well. So, Miku, so, I don't want to interrupt you, but we can't yeah. see our, your screen. So I'm wondering if um, we can share Miku's screen. We might have to take all the faces off just for a minute, but. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. It's all gone now. <laughs> <laughs> we can still hear you though. Okay, should I continue? Um, sure, just no, we can't see the slides yet, but we can let you know. Okay. 
So um, I was born to a rice farmer family and my um, other family member are in the fishery industry here in Miyagi. And our city is located right next to the Pacific Oceans uh, where we are fortunate to have a nutritious uh, marine environment. And our main um, industries are rice, um, oyster and seaweed. So I personally grew up with the uh, um, oceans and the ocean is something that I always uh, stays by my side, no matter what happened, um, for example, in 2011. So I experienced the Great Eastern Earthquake um, and a tsunami at the age of 12 when I was uh, sixth grade. Okay. So I stop, um, share the screen for a second. Um, so I would say triple disaster, um, earthquake, tsunami, and the aftermath of um, TEPCO, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. As you can see in the picture, sorry, um, I think it's not on the screen yet, um, but my city was completely destroyed by the tsunami and over um, 18,000 people in total in Japan died from this disaster. I lost my house, my tangible memories, friends and teachers from a massive tsunami wave, and I still clear, uh, clearly remember the day of March 11, a snowy and a cold day. I've been working on uh, passing my experience with my tsunami, uh, natural disaster as my responsibility um, to a diverse generations to prepare future natural disaster. After experiencing the disaster, I started thinking about the meaning of water, the Pacific Oceans, and our rights to protect our oceans from future uh, disaster, environmental harm, and nuclearizations. So I was mentally tra uh, traumatized from the tsunami when I was in middle school, but I also was in a place where I didn't feel um, comfortable with a Japanese sociological uh, tendency where young people and women are not fully respected. So after living in um, Europe and Pacific, Hawaii, um, I started gaining a new perspective to see the world, but also to see a human nature relations, especially from indigenous community in the Pacific and the concept of aloha aina, the love for land from native Hawaiians. Uh, sometimes I am ashamed about my identity as a young Japanese woman from a country who is not uh, taking any responsible actions for nuclear incident. Although the issues uh, with a nuclear power station happen here in Tohoku regions, I would think that um, I would like to think as it um, as it one global issues to face together by uh, tracing back our history with colonialism and imperialism, rather than uh, stepping back and being silent about it. Um, so our Pacific Ocean is beautiful. Um, the ocean is vast, and ocean feeds us every single day here in Japan but we only have one Pacific Ocean to share in the Pacific. And this is our time to deconstruct the space of silent violence against our right to protect our oceans, land and people. So during COVID, I came back to my community in Japan. And this is when I started realizing the urgency of protecting our oceans from any harm. When I say harm, I meant um, nuclear violence, climate change and also urgency in lack of awareness of such this important social issues here in my community. So today um, I hope to share some of my perspectives and works on these nuclear issues from um, human nature relationship developed here in my hometown. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you, Miku, for that um, really beautiful introduction. Um, my name's Elena. Um, I'll be very quick because I don't want to take too much time away from people who are actually living here and experiencing um, these issues. Um, however, if you don't mind, I'd like to share about how I got here and what I've learned so far. So as Carly mentioned, I'm currently a PhD candidate at Kyoto University, which is in the Kansai region. Um, but I've been researching social, economic, and political issues surrounding fisheries governance in here in Miyagi for about five years. Um, I started as an MA student, a master's student, studying about how the government had decided to, quote unquote, revitalize the fishing industry after the disaster, and how the opinions and viewpoints of local fishers don't necessarily align with the government's way of thinking. 
Uh, this topic got me really interested in learning about local governance structure, the fisheries governance structure, especially looking at the agency and self-determination of uh, local fishers and decision-making processes. So while I haven't studied the nuclear incident uh, in particular, um, I think looking at how local fishers lack power and how it stems from an embedded stru structural discrimination, um, I think that tends to benefit capitalist actors rather than local people. I think that point is an important aspect to recognize when we talk about change and transitions within Japanese society. So my perception on the situation here is very much from an academic standpoint. And so I recognize that I'm probably not the best person to share direct experiences with. Um, I will leave that to Miku, Chiba-san, and Futoshi-san later on. I do, however, want to share some points that um, I think are important for us to understand about sustainability or even advocacy in the fishing industry here in Japan. So the first point I would like to share is um, about local fishers and their sense of sustainability. Um, so doing field work with fishers, the nuclear incident and environmental, environmental issues in general are very sensitive and controversial. Um, it's not really something that they like to bring up. And I think in that sense, Futoshi-san, who will present in our next panel, is quite rare in that sense. Um, but during my fieldwork, I really got the sense that local fishers think sustainability is important, but the way that they interpret sustainability is different from our Western perspective or even the perspective of regional or national governments here in Japan. So fishers don't really use the word sustainability. Um, because that kind of brings up some negative images and like uh, kind of associated with international organizations like Greenpeace, which doesn't always have like the best connotation in this area because we do have like smaller scale whaling fisheries. Um, but almost every fisher that I have spoken to has always talked about the importance of ocean cleanliness and ensuring that they have good quality fish um, that come back every single season. They understand that if the environment, which includes the ocean, the land, the mountains, if that's bad, it will impact their fishing and their livelihoods. This is the difference between knowledge structures surrounding sustainability, the difference between traditional knowledge and Western knowledge. I think it's important to understand the power dynamics between each form of knowledge and how they interact. Many times, as I'm sure there are, is the same in many places with traditional knowledge structures, Local knowledge is not always seen as valuable or even efficient, however, uh, because it's not easy to write down, it's not easy to publish in journals, and it's not easy to write into policy. However, it's the knowledge that has sustained many local communities around the world, just like here in Miyagi. And then the second point I'd like to talk about is uh, fishers and their decision-making power here in Miyagi. Um, as I mentioned, I think for uh, all local people, fisher and non-fisher, this topic is really hard to talk about. Chiba san also mentioned this. Um, but I think for fishers in particular, local, especially small scale, they already do not have a lot of adequate opportunity to participate in decision uh, making. So from my perspective, I don't really find it too surprising that they're not able to voice their opinions or share openly about the nuclear debate as much. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I won't go into too much depth just because I just want to give you some idea about the struggles of local fisher that local fishers face in just participating in decision making within their own industry. Um, so one example in Ishinomaki is the development of the Momono Ura Special Zone for Fisheries or the Toku. Um, it's a privatized area of the coast that is exclusively for fisheries companies to join without having to go through traditional governing processes. I don't think our slides are working. I had a map of it, but I guess it's fine. Um, so the issue, the main issues with this project is that the governor of Miyagi just went along with this project without consulting with local fisheries cooperatives or local fisheries, uh, local fishers. Um, while I don't have too much time to go into like depth about the fisheries governance structure, it's very complicated. Um, I will just briefly explain that traditionally fishing rights are distributed through local fishing cooperatives, so the Gyokyo. And this system has been in place ever since the first fishing law, and it has been the foundation in many fishing communities around Japan. So to get fishing rights, you have to be a part of the cooperative, and the cooperatives are governed by local fishers. 
they all work together to determine how much to fish, what to fish, and where to fish at a given time and place. However, the development of this special zone completely eliminates the necessity to register through the local cooperative, and they are just able to register directly through the prefectural government. So this is completely unheard of in Japan. And the reason that this fishing law, uh, this special zone was able to go through was because of the recent change to the fisheries law, which was amended for the first time since its creation in 2020. The amendment made it legal to bypass the fishing cooperatives. The fishing law itself, the, the amendment is quite controversial in and of itself. And some even argue that the whole amendment of the fisheries law was to appease outsiders or the international community, just to show that the Japanese government is taking steps to promote sustainable fisheries. Um, in practice, however, we have projects like the special zone where the government, the regional government admits that the purpose is economic development and that by allowing easier entry into the fishing industry, it will boost the local economy and help the region revitalize revitalize, quote unquote, from their vision of what revitalization is. However, this form of re revitalization excludes local people's participation and opinions. Is that what we would call sustainability? I'm not sure. The complete disregard for local governance structures is disrespectful, and the government unfairly distributes fishing rights to capitalist elite, rather than local people who rely on their res those resources for their life uh, rather than just for purely profit reasons. This is the kind of project that does not consult local people about what they want or what they need post-disaster. So based on my experience in the field, I think many people agree that they do not need or want a fisheries economic zone. The blatant and intentional gap in communication between the government, corporate entities, and local people is huge. This gap reflects power dynamics, which reflects the communication of knowledge. So this is the information I would like to leave you with. Hopefully this gives you some background into the fisheries governance structure here. But like I said, it is much more complex and I would never be able to explain all of it in such a small amount of time. Um, this is also just my interpretation as an outsider and observer researching here in Miyagi. Um, and I'm sorry that I don't have more information about the nuclear issues in particular, but thankfully I have Miku, Toshisan, Shiba-san, Tami, um, who were all in some capacity either born and raised here or researching here that can give you a more expert opinion as community members here. Um, those who have lived in the fishing community have the fishing livelihood embedded in their lives. So I would like to hand it back over to Miku-san. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. Um, I think you covered a um, really good uh, point of the impact of power dynamics still underlying here in my community. And I will just talk about um, maybe just two points to add to your, to your talk. So one is the right to carry the responsibility, quote unquote, knowing the incident as a young generation. So after you mentioned about the power dynamic within my community within a small community uh, like my city um, it reminds me the perception that I always had towards our government and also um, our rights to pro our rights to have responsibility to to protect our environment so in terms of uh, Tepco Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster and the radioactive effects I was not educated uh, about this topic of nuclear or aftermath of nuclear incident in middle school so I always, I was always questioning myself, uh, what is happening in Fukushima? Like it's only a couple of hours from where I live. Am I safe? Um, I had those constant uh, fears towards unknown for a future for quite a long time. And I realized what was actually happened after I moved to Europe, France, and many of my classmates and people uh, started ask, asking me about this uh, 311 disaster. So I had to do research by myself. And I would say if I didn't leave Japan um, as a student, I would I would have no knowledge or perceptions about this nuclear violence right now. So um, because I live both in agricultural and um, fishery community here, uh, where foods or growing foods sustain our lives, and uh, radioactive contaminations has been always our biggest worry as a producer. 
And at the same time, we cannot and we should not escape from these issues. However, we as a community are still um, under fear because we are not receiving enough information from our governments and we are still struggling to find our justice. And the second point is the importance of solidarity. After I came back to Japan um, during COVID, I started working on uh, with our fisheries on revitalizing and maintaining our aquaculture, especially in oyster industries with both uh, government, federal and the regional governments. And as I grew up in the fishery community, uh, we immediately see changes of our oceans um, from our seafoods, the amount of fish we catch, or even the shape of oyster is changing due to climate change. And my current project goal is to create a sustainable fishery community uh, where we can um, protect our coastal uh, fishery culture and create a learning opportunity for people to learn about the importance of environments um, from our lifestyle. And their knowledge and appreciation to our lands has uh, passed down from our ancestors, and we are so appreciate to have this. So as our next panel, we'll talk about the wastewater discharge, which is coming from um, just a couple of years from now. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, sorry, I'm sure we'll suffer somehow from this discharge of uh, wastewater as a food producer, fisher, or young generations. So if we are aiming a, a nuclear-free society as a uh, one nations or just as a one a large Pacific Rim nations, and our sole motivations goal, and um, our goal should focus on how to sustain our life, our oceans, and our people. To achieve this goal, I think it's really important to bring uh, solidarity among people who wish to denuclear uh, denuclear our society for a peaceful future where we can live without any fears. And I would say that um, this the TEPCO incident in Fukushima, we can say the same thing. Um, so we need a solidarity to stop uh, wastewater discharge, which is coming uh, soon. And from now, or any nuclear um, power regenerating um, here in Japan. I take as my responsibility to deal with this aftermath uh, of triple disaster. However, the climate change, uh, deep nuclearization, is a still huge and big wall that we need to overcome um, as a one large nation who share a Pacific Ocean. So um, as I conclude my talk here, um, I wanted to share one quote from Epile How Offer, um, Our Sea of Islands. So he says, uh, we are the sea, we are the oceans. We must wake up to the, this ancient truth together and together. Use it to overturn all hegemonic views that aim ultimately to confine us again, physically and psychologically, in the tiny space which we have resisted accepting as our sole appointed place, and from which we have recently liberated ourselves. We must not allow anyone to be, uh, belittle us again and take away, from, take away our freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just... I really like how we changed the order, but we can hear Yumi San, Chiba San talking about how hard it is to speak up about nuclear issues and the power that she feels in her everyday life and people around her. And then we see that, you know, the way of turning the page in the words of Hina, um, everything's fine. And then we're revitalizing everything. There's this Fuko. And then we get to hear from Elena and Miku that that is also, there are very uneven power relations in the reconstruction work that is going on as well. And so thank you for sharing that. 